Celebrate atop the fourth wall's ninth anniversary and your love for superheroes who spell words wrong so a company can trademark a name by pre-ordering the Because Poor Literacy is Cool shirt now on sharkrobot.com. Link in the description. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. And welcome, my friends, to Secret Origins Month. Okay, it's not Secret Origins Month, but you can play the bumper anyway. Yeah, here's the thing. The last two months have been pretty hectic. In fact, the last two years have been pretty hectic. I need a vacation, the first proper one I've ever had. So next week, no new review. And normally that'd be fine. Secret Origins Month once had a delay that forced me to release two parts on the same day so that it was only three weeks worth. Problem is that Patreon-sponsored reviews got some backlog on them, and, well, the coming year is gonna have a lot of spaces reserved for reviews I want to do because of the 10th anniversary, so I needed to dip into November for this one. So, yeah, it's gonna be Secret Origins 2 Disconnected Weeks, which sadly is not quite as marketable a title. But hey, you're getting a Marvel origin and a DC origin, kind of a villain origin, and a team origin in those two weeks, so I think you should all be happy. Plus, the Patreon-sponsored review is for some common Rider, so even more people will be happy. We are going way back for this one. For those who don't know, the name DC Comics comes from the original book that Batman came from, Detective Comics. Meaning their true name is someone stuttering, Detective Comic Comics. Related, Marvel is also named after an old comics magazine called Marvel Comics. Both companies started as different publishers altogether, with the case of Marvel starting out as timely publications. Their first offering was, of course, Marvel Comics number one. While the Fantastic Four are considered the beginning of the Marvel Universe proper, this is where we find the first appearances of a few characters, namely the original Human Torch, and the subject of today's review, Namor the Submariner. Aquaman may be the water-based superhero who's more well-known, but Namor was there first. In fact, he's one of Marvel's first characters ever. Namor was both written and drawn by Bill Everett, who also co-created Daredevil, and first appeared not in this comic, but in Motion Picture Funnies Weekly, a comic that was never actually made. The idea was a promotional comic given away at theaters to children, but theater owners didn't really take to the idea, so it was shelved. Namor appeared in an eight-page black-and-white story, and the contents ended up repackaged for Marvel Comics number one, with the Namor story made into color and four more pages were added. Supposedly, the inspiration for Namor came about pretty much to be an opposite. From what I've read, Everett was told about how Carl Burgos was creating the original Human Torch, and he decided a fire-and-water alternate dynamic would work well, so he based the character around water. Although, like Aquaman, the character has become associated with being a ruler of Atlantis, Bill Everett specifically did not want his home to be Atlantis, since he believed Atlantis to be a true place, a lost continent that could someday be discovered. He felt that it would perhaps be best discovered via a popular science fiction series spin-off show. But such things are the stuff of dreams. So why Namor when I've barely shown him off before this? Well, let's dig into Marvel Comics number one and we'll see why. Oh. 
stronger than a whale. He can swim anywhere. He can breathe underwater and go flying through the air. The cover is unrelated to Namor, instead pushing the first appearance of the original Human Torch. Nothing much to note other than the fact that the Human Torch clearly just wants a hug. We begin with the Submariner opening up the long-lost Bill Everett treasure chest. Here is the Submariner, an Ultraman of the Deep! So, Submariner is actually the second series after Sub-Q? Lives on land and sea, flies in the air, has the strength of a thousand men, yet he won't come help me move on Saturday. Is a youth of dynamic personality, quick thought, and fast action. Are we sure we're not reading his dating profile? From whence does he come, and what is his mission? Oh, clearly he's fulfilled his mission. He found the treasure chest! We truly open on a salvage ship sending down a diver to explore a wreck. When he returns, he mentions there's something odd about the remains. I found the safe in the main saloon, all right, but it looks like somebody got here before we did. The safe's empty! It's almost like they had some kind of adventure aboard the Poseidon. They haven't heard about any other salvage vessels being in the area, but want some more information. So they send the guy and another back down again to see if they can find any evidence of anyone else out there. And so Carly settles beneath the surface, little knowing the phenomena he and Nelson are about to witness. And lo, it was called a sham wow. The two discover a hatch that's been opened that was closed the last time they went down, much to their confusion. On the sea bottom, they converse by telephone. Hang on, Steve, let me just turn on the oxygen app on my phone. Inside, they spot Namor swimming around, again baffled by the presence of someone able to swim in that amount of pressure. He eludes the two and wonders himself who they are. Those robots, they can't be men. Only women can look that good in diving suits. Why, they're mechanical and so ponderous, yet they're shaped like men. And certainly they're not fish. I mean, I know some puffer fish who have been putting on some weight, but jeez. Figuring that they might be dangerous, he cuts the air hose and telephone cables, forcing the divers to seal their remaining air inside. Namor then swims up to one, and stabs him, proceeding to crush his head and helmet with his bare hands. Wow, these robots really have a lot of cherry filling. The boat on the surface sends another guy down to see what's going on, but he immediately wants to be called back up when he sees the dead bodies, risking harm by going so quickly to the surface. Once he reports what he saw, the boat captain decides to tell the Coast Guard, setting the ship on its way. However, Namor spots the departing boat and grabs the propeller. The captain orders an all-stop because of the engine disruption, but Namor instead instead just pushes the boat back to shore before shoving it into some rocks. Yeah, if the earlier murders weren't enough of an indication, this episode once again fulfills people's requests for villain origin reviews, because Namor is pretty much a bad guy in his first outing. Still, best buddies with Rom Space Knight. Namor returns to his home in a secluded grotto with the dead bodies of the divers. He enters a huge chapel-like chamber, and is addressed by a beautifully robed creature on the far end of the hall. Well, the narrator is either really into fashionable robes or really into elderly fishwomen. Neither option is all that great at this point. Namor has the two as an offering for the old woman, who is curious what they are. He takes off the helmets to reveal that they were in fact people and not robots. Another woman approaches him. Congratulations, my son. You have made a good beginning in our war of revenge. You know, most parents get upset when their kid commits mass murder. Good to see Namor's mom as being so supportive of his hobby. His mother orders the bodies be ossified and shown off to the people as an example of what they're gonna do to the surface people, but Namor is confused. But mother, I don't quite understand. Why are the Earth people so bad? Wasn't my father an Earth man? Your father was a deadbeat who's three payments behind on his alimony! Don't pretend he was a saint! She explains that while his father was a good guy, his people weren't. That they're responsible for nearly exterminating their underwater civilization. She flashes back to meeting his dad back in 1920 near the South Pole when a scientific expedition set up their base on an ice floe directly above their city. During the weeks that followed, we were tormented with bombardments of high explosives. Our castles were demolished. Our husbands, wives, mothers, and even children were killed in droves. Oh, that was intentional. They're trying to get the thing and its spaceship out from under the ice. The white Earth men were blasting us out of existence with their infernal scientific investigations. The history of the world in a nutshell, really. 
Soon, many more ships arrived. Building a better snowless Arctic. And finally, in desperation, our elders commanded an army to be formed, and I, most nearly resembling the female of the white race, was invested as a spy. Wow, the original script for Avatar was a lot more interesting. She was believed to be a stowaway on the ship, leading to her and the captain falling in love while she continued to feed information back to their people. Unfortunately, what she learned was that they were too well armed to fight against. Too late at that, as one powerful bombardment resulted in most of the assembled army being killed before they could counterattack, scattering the few who remained. That was, of course, 20 years prior to this, so it's taken that long for them to build up a new group that could avenge the dead. Namor being able to do those things, the first panel told us that he could do, so he has to be the advance guard against something. Go now to the land of the white people, AKA America, fuck yeah. Namor tells his cousin, Dorma, about his mission. Oh, Namor, how wonderful. Take me with you, please. Oh yeah, Namor, bring your cousin along in a fun trip to slaughter the human scum. He tells her it's too dangerous, but that she can come along for part of the trip. They travel for two days until they encounter a lighthouse. Namor figures that this will be a good first stop. Namor knocks on the lighthouse door and punches the guy who answers it. Hello? What? Oh! Man, door-to-door -door salesmen are getting more aggressive all the time! Namor runs up to smash the controls, but quickly heads back down again when Dorma screams for help. One of the lighthouse keepers has grabbed her. Namor throws him out to sea and... Jeez, look at that distance! I bet he made him skip on the surface like a stone. Back in the lighthouse, a guy emerges with a rifle. Oh no, Namor didn't know about the standard issue lighthouse sniper! However, Namor just flies up and knocks the guy down. Dorma runs in too. Namor, what are you doing? Beating people up? What the hell did you think you were here to do? They smash the beacon light, but the lighthouse is soon surrounded by sailors who just decided to show up. I don't know, it's a small island. Maybe they were just stationed there. In any event, I'm guessing he doesn't want to risk Dorma's life, which is why, despite having the strength of a thousand men, he doesn't try to take on the sailors. Instead, he spots a nearby plane and thinks their method of escape can be to sneak on board it. I also have to assume that this flight would be hampered by extra weight, otherwise why not just fly her out to safety without the plane? They get on board and deal with the pilot. The airman is no test for Namor's superhuman strength, and with a terrific blow, Namor sends him flying into space. Man, who knew the first man in space was just some random crop duster flying a bit lower than usual? And so our story ends with Namor telling Dorma that he has to leave for his mission fully now. As such, he tells her she should wreck the plane and swim home. Considering I don't know how to fly a plane, that shouldn't be too hard. And so Namor dives into the ocean again, on his way to further adventures in his crusade against white men. Unfortunately, awkwardness ensues when he accidentally resurfaces in Guyana. This story is a pretty good origin, the only problem is that it really is for a bad guy. Many people comment on the fact that Namor, while technically a villain in his earliest appearances, is more of an anti-hero, or at least a bit more complex than villains at the time, because he's not motivated by greed, power, or evil for its own sake, but rather vengeance on a legitimate wrong done against his people. And that's not an unfair assessment when the average comic book villain at the time could be a crime lord named Big Dicks. Namor, being driven by a sense of justice for his people, makes it believable that he'd be willing to become a well-respected hero later on. The only problem I see in it is that the first thing we see him do is murder a bunch of innocent people. And if he had killed them in self-defense, or at least made some effort to communicate with him before he just outright slaughtered them, that might be different. But the way he specifically just friggin' stabs a guy and crushes his head is kind of douchey, not helped by then destroying a ship that was retreating. The artwork and overall writing are pretty solid. Although coloring-wise, I question the repeated usage of referring to them as white men considering Namor and his cousin, went out of the water. They look pretty Caucasian themselves. Maybe it could be seen as a metaphor for passing, just limited coloring options, but I can't say for certain. Next week, as I've said, has no new episode. In two weeks, however, come back for the origin of the Justice League of America.
Well, as time went on, the commander and I fell in love and were married by their own ritual. Everyone seemed rather put off when I threw that bouquet of seaweed. 